Good morning, and welcome to the third annual Boomers and Beyond Academy at OLLI. I'm Suba Sadi, an ARP volunteer community ambassador with the AARP state office here in Virginia. With more than 1 million members in Virginia, AARP is the largest organization working on behalf of people age 50 plus and their families in the Commonwealth. ARP Virginia is, is here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun local opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational, and fun resources. Things like webinars, teletown halls, discounts, and more. When it's safe to host in-person events, you'll be invited to attend. In the meantime, AARP Virginia will continue to offer programs virtually. I encourage you to visit our website, aarp.org forward slash VA where we always share great information on local resources and events. Once again, that website is aarp.org forward slash VA. Due to the pandemic, there have been some critical shifts in the way business and life is conducted. Take this event, for example. Rather than cancel it, we decided to make it virtual. And here you are joining us from the comfort and safety of your home on a semi-gorgeous Saturday morning. We have a great program planned for you. I'd like to thank the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University, Ali Mason, for continuing to partner with us on this annual event, even in these challenging times. Now I'll turn the screen over to Ms. Jennifer DeSano, Executive Director of Ali Mason, to share a little bit about Ali Mason and the wonderful programs they offer. Thank you so much, Suba. Thank you so much for doing this program with us every year. And uh, I'm really glad that we were able to make it happen despite the pandemic and, and we are having great participation. We're so excited to bring you this program today. I'm going to share my screen with you um, and give you just a brief overview of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute and what we do. So there we go. And let me set my timer because I'm on a strict timeline. <laughs> so learning knows no age. Uh, and at OLLI, it, we offer courses and classes, but there are also lots of volunteer opportunities for teaching and uh, in doing things over at the university, like research projects and intergenerational exchanges. Um, take it from Albert Einstein, uh, you don't have to be clever or especially gifted, You're just curious to be a lifelong learner. And uh, I hope that you all are, and judging from the fact that you're here today, I know you're curious pe people. Um, the Lifelong Learning Program at George Mason University began from a desire among retirees to enjoy university level courses, explore interests and collect social and intellectual, or be, connect socially and intellectually with, uh, with people, their peer group. And for 30 years, Ali has um, enhanced the cultural vitality of the surrounding community. Um, we are, we offer a, an expansive academic program, but there's no homework and no tests and there are no prerequisites, but uh, it's a lot of fun and we have over 600 programs that we put on a year in everything you can think of art, music, philosophy, science, policy, current events, and our teachers, well, our teachers are not paid. They're all here as volunteers and Ollie is really a cooperative. So we have a lot of our members, people who are members of the organization 
that teach for us and about 50% of the courses that we put on are taught by the members themselves. And then 20% are taught by Mason professors that come over and teach for free and put on wonderful lectures for us. And then we have 30% are, are kind of subject matter experts or community members from around the region. We are so fortunate to live in the DC metro region and be able to draw on so many resources from the park service to you know think tanks in DC to uh, just a whole a whole host of wonderful um, entities that are just at our fingertips here so we're very enriched our program is, is uh, draws on that there are 120 Ollie's Osher lifelong learning institutes across the nation at uh, and they're attached to institutions of higher learning um, and we are, we you know, uh, collectively over 400,000 uh, OLLI members. So there's a lot of wonderful kind of cross across these different organizations sharing of best practices and, uh, and we learn from each other and it's a wonderful group to be a part of. So no matter where you live in the nation, you can always find an OLLI. Um, so if you're planning to retire somewhere other than Northern Virginia, just go to the National Resource Center of Ollie's and you can find a map that will identify an Ollie near you. Some of them are called Oshers. Um, they have different names, but Osher is a good thing to Google. So what does Ollie Mason provide? Ollie George Mason provides educational programming, leadership opportunities, and cultural enrichment for over 1,200 intellectually curious Northern Virginian retirees. The Ali program aids regional policymakers in search of programs to serve our uh, growing senior demographics. So we work with um, uh, the governor's office on Virginia uh, aging, and we work with our gerontology people over at George Mason University to talk about what we can do uh, regionally and also with the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council of Fairfax County. And we promote beneficial synergies. Uh, we obviously, I talked about teaching, we do research and intergenerational activities with the students over at George Mason. And we'll get into that a little bit more. There's some professional opportunities for our professors, administrators, and students to come over here to our campus and teach for OLLI. Um, they uh, We'll talk about whatever the latest research is that they are doing. For example, in this image, this, this uh, is a PhD student. He actually completed his PhD uh, in the engineering department. He gave us a presentation on, on drones. Um, so we'll have um, our students from the university come over and tell us about what they're working on and we get firsthand accounts of the research that they're doing. Uh, if, we have authors that come over and they'll talk about the books that they've written. In fact, we have a collaboration with the Fall for the Book Festival, which is going on right now. And you can learn more if you go to fallforthebook.org. They have a whole virtual book festival that is going on and Ollie is a part of that. And we br they bring in 140 authors uh, in the fall of every year and OLLI members get to go in normal times and <laughs> go over to hear their presentations um, we had, uh, we've had a number of popular authors from, um, Balducci to, um, the, uh, the, the recent Colson Whitehead Pulitzer Prize winning author was just here last year. So we, we have such great access to amazing things, uh, through OLLI and through the university. We also have, uh, our students come over and do performances. And uh, we have a lot of other things going on where the students are engaged with us on um, gardening that we do out in the, on the campus. And um, our, our university professors come over and give us lectures and these students come in and we have live presentations of music and uh, theater and all kinds of uh, research as I mentioned. So there's just an abundance uh, in return for the participation of the academic staff at Mason and also the students that come over, Ollie likes to give back to the students. So we do, uh, we do fundraise for scholarships and these students have been wonderful uh, 
recipients of our scholarships. So lifelong learning is a full cycle. It does you never stop learning. And uh, we want we understand that. And so we give funds back to the university in the, in the form of student scholarships and also special programming grants. For example, we've given money to the Mason libraries so that they can enjoy um, you know, hiring a student to do special research projects. Um, we also have helped out the Early Identification Program and the Office of Military Services with funds. As I mentioned, Fall for the Book is a big part of our program as well. Uh, we do engage in intergenerational learning activities where we've had our, our students go over to the university and sit in on classes with students and, and advise them. Um, we, we did a few special projects, as I mentioned, with the uh, library where we take in uh, oral histories of our members. Um, we also do tutoring and we give career advice to the students. In some cases, we've even had uh, foreign students hosted by our members. Uh, board service is also kind of a part of being a, the uh, part of our organization. A lot of our members actually serve on boards at the university. So there's a lot of engagement with what's going on at the university and, you know, drawing on the knowledge and experience of the people who are members of our organization. We also have professional services that we donate in the form of our photography clubs. They, they'll take pictures for the theater students, um, also out in the community. Um, and that's a lot of fun. So our photographers will go out and work with students and take images. And, uh, and these are actually some great images that they've taken and then the, the arts program will put them in their programs for the Center of Performing Arts. As I mentioned, we have certain research opportunities and OLLI members can get engaged with those fun things too. Um, and we've done a number of projects where where uh, students will do sit and stand and um, vision and hearing uh, tests and stress tests and things like that. So that's kind of fun if you're interested in getting into um, that kind of engaging engagement. Um, let's see my PowerPoint. So here are just some fun images of field trips that we've done, uh, theater productions. We have a, a, a lot of fun in our classes and um, <laughs> we also have opportunities to play music. There's, of course, the lectures and then excursions. Um, and then we also have lots of fun parties that we do. There's just so much to do at Ollie Mason. Along with taking classes, we'd love for you to get engaged with us and learn more about us. Um, you can go to ollie.gmu.edu ollie to learn more. And um, I'm so glad that you all are here today. Whoops, I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> and uh, I think, let me see how much time I have left. I have three minutes left. If anybody wants to put a question in the q and I'm happy to answer it. Um, we have this fall a special promotion. If you'd like to join Ollie, it's, it's usually $450, but this fall you can join for $300. And that gives you unlimited classes throughout the entire year. It's, it's really uh, quite, quite a wonderful price for an amazing array of programming that you can get um, engaged with while you're at home because everything is virtual, at least until we can come back face to face, which we're all looking forward to. We have three campuses in Northern Virginia, one in Fairfax, one in Reston, and one in Loudoun. I think I have a couple of questions. What is the email address? Uh, okay, let me tell you, it's Ali. O-L-L-I at gmu.edu. So that's the email address. And then the cost per person is $300 a person right now. If you're a brand new member, it's normally $450 a person. Does Ollie at George Mason ever collaborate with Ollie in Maryland? Not, we don't have a, like a reciprocity agreement or anything like that. We do have um, programming collaborations. Is the $300 fee for a calendar year? Yes, it's for the whole year, not just one semester. It's quite the deal, let me tell you. Um, any other questions? And I love that you guys are using the Q&A. We're gonna be using that throughout the, uh, the day here while when you get your, um, when you get to hear the other presenters. Um, what Ollie course would you like if I was, oh! <laughs> Well, we have this really fun group called the Ollie Players, and it's a theater, the theatrical troupe. And so the question is, what course would I take if I were retired right now? 
Um, so I would definitely get involved with them. They're really, they are really fun. Uh, they put on productions. They're going to be putting one on next week. So that's something that I would do because I'm a ham. <laughs> is there an Ollie in Maryland? Where is it located? So Bethesda, I think, and I think it's with American University and then uh, Johns Hopkins, I think is the next nearest. Um, but you can, as I said, you can go to just Google Osher. Um, Osher Lifelong Learning, and you'll come up with a link, um, and that'll take you to a map that will kind of map out everything, all the different alleys around the country. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Oh my goodness, I'm right on time. <laughs> and so we would love to have you. We're we're right here. You can you can join today and start classes in a couple of weeks. Fall doesn't start, uh, I think, until, oh, I think our first presentation is going to be the week of the 24th, something like that. So a lot of fun is uh, out there, and you're going to have some fun if you join, I promise. And you'll meet people, even, in the, even though we're going to be virtual, there'll be lots of discussion groups and things like that. So thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad you're all here. Uh, I, I wish you a wonderful day, and please stay safe and uh, enjoy. Hey, folks, we've got uh, the exciting stuff coming up. So just to let you know a quick uh, summation of the time, uh, I'm going to be introducing Ken Budd. Uh, and then after him, uh, we'll have a 15-minute break. Uh, and then uh, we'll get Sally on, and I'll do the closing remarks. So that's just the way the day is going to break out. So thank you again, Jennifer. So it's my pleasure now to introduce and welcome our first speaker, uh, Ken Budd. Ken was already questioning the meaning of life when his father died from a sudden heart attack. After volunteering in New Orleans, nine months after Hurricane Katrina, Ken began an unexpected journey as a global volunteer working at an elementary school in Costa Rica, a special needs school in China, a climate change project in Ecuador, assorted projects in the West Bank, and a children's home in Kenya. Wow. Ken's emotional presentation will share his life-changing insights from those experiences and offer advice to would-be volunteers. He's the author of the award-winning memoir, The Volu Volunteerist, and his story for the Washington Post magazine on his return to Kenya will appear in the 2020 edition of the Best American Travel Writing available in stores on November the 3rd. Ken has written for the Atlantic National Geographic.com, the New York Times, and many more. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Ken Budd. Uh, well, it's good to be here. I should say, first off, I look like Brent Musburger, I've decided. Uh, I am not a morning person, so I appreciate your being here for what seems uh, early to me, but I am fully caffeinated, so I'm, I think things will go just fine. Uh, I'm coming to you from Burke, Virginia, here in Fairfax. Uh, I did a, I was in a meeting recently, and someone told me this background looked like Masterpiece Theater. And then I pointed out that the book behind me is Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Zeus, which I think completely destroyed the illusion. <laughs> so, but thank you so much for joining us uh, virtually today. I'm going to share my screen now. Bear with me. This is the miracle of modern technology at work here. So as uh, Suba mentioned in the intro, uh, I volunteered around the world. So I'm going to tell you about those experiences, what I learned from that, and then I'll briefly tell you uh, a little bit about things you should know if you want to volunteer abroad as well, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. So there's a story I like to tell because I think it captures what the short-term volunteer experience is really like. And for two weeks, uh, my wife and I volunteered at a children's home in Kenya. And we did uh, whatever work was required. We washed dishes, we folded clothes, we scrubbed floors. Uh, my wife is always thrilled when I show that photograph. And at the end of our two weeks, we asked the woman who ran the home, we said, what can we do as a way of saying thank you? So we, we did two things. 
we bought new mattresses. The kids slept on these really thin mattresses, sometimes two and three to a bed. And she said, why don't you make dinner? Because what you basically had here were about four or five women who were caring for like 42 kids. So we said, hey, this is great. We'll make dinner. The women will get a night off. The kids will eat something different. This is going to be great. Now, making dinner for 42 kids sounds like a really great idea until you make dinner for 42 kids. <clears throat> And we knew we were not dealing with the Food Network kitchen here. There was no running water. The knives were so dull. I remember my wife cut her finger because of the knife just slid off a carrot. But the main problem we had was boiling water. The Kenyans frequently cook on these outdoor charcoal stoves, and we were going to make spaghetti. And we had this huge pot. It was much bigger than what you see here. You could swim laps in this pot. It was enormous. And we put all our water in, and we put it on the stove, and nothing happened. I mean, the water just sat there. And 10 minutes passed, and then 20 minutes passed. And after 30 minutes, I thought, you know, we don't really have plan B here. We're, we're pretty committed to making this meal. You know, it's not like we're calling Domino's. After 40 minutes, I thought, we have an international incident on our hands. I could see the headlines, you know, American couple starves local children. And it took an hour, an hour, and the water finally began to boil. And we threw in our noodles, and we threw in the meat and the sauce. And it was so gratifying to see the kids eat this meal. I, I remember one little girl had a noodle on her head because she had shoved her face in the bowl. And I thought, well, this is why you do this, because you want to do just a little bit of good. And it may not always go the way you expect, but if you stick with it and you persevere, you can do just a little bit of good. The meat in our sauce was the first meat these kids had had in over a month. So we gave them a little protein. And I had reached this point in life where I was kind of looking for some meat as well. And it was a variety of things. Uh, I had just turned 40. Uh, it's always a great time for a midlife crisis. Um, my dad had passed away. My wife and I were we didn't have kids and I was struggling with that, but it was really the loss of my father. And my father died very suddenly. He was playing golf. He'd been retired about a year. He was 65. He collapsed and just like that, he was gone. And once he was gone, I start getting these letters from his friends and they're saying, you know, your father really changed my life. Because my dad was a special guy. He, he grew up extremely poor. Uh, he didn't go to college, but he was smart and he was ambitious and he worked twice as hard as the guys with the degrees. So I'm getting these letters and people saying, man, your, your dad, your dad changed my life. And I, I thought, man, you know, pff, you know, what am I doing? What are people going to say when it's my turn to hit the earth? And completely unexpectedly through my job at AARP, an opportunity arose to volunteer in New Orleans nine months after Hurricane Katrina. And with out even thinking about it, I took it. And I didn't know it then, but I had started a journey and it would take me to Costa Rica, to China, to Ecuador, to the West Bank, and finally to Kenya. And I have four lessons from that volunteer experience and that's what I wanna share with you today. And the first is this, there is power in small gestures and there is power in small acts of kindness. And you know, I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not gonna write some massive check for somebody. And I typically, when I volunteered, I was there like two weeks and you think, you know, what can you really do in such a short period of time? But when I was in Costa Rica, you know, we volunteered for two weeks at an elementary school and we taught English to the kids there. And the day we arrived, the guy who ran the program there told me, that in a lot of developing countries, parents will send their kids to school rather than to work because foreigners are there. And if foreigners are there, well, there must be something interesting going on. So sometimes you make a difference just by showing up. And I saw this in China. And a friend and I worked at a, a special needs school there, and it's in the city of Xi'an. And I was mainly with a group of about third graders and just did whatever was needed. You know, they just needed a lot of attention. And I was 
primarily paired with a little boy named Lee Baojin. And he had developmental disabilities, and so I would do things like this. They wanted to help him with his motor skills, so we would write numbers and Chinese characters. And sometimes he just needed help getting places. He just was much, he moved much more slowly than the other kids. But I always thought the most important thing was just being there because these teachers worked incredibly difficult jobs. And my friend and I were like an English speaking novelty. You know, we were like a break in their routine. I remember they, they at some point they bought an English Chinese dictionary and they would kind of huddle around it and try out new words on us. And I heard that after we left, one of the teachers said, you know, we, we seem to laugh more when we have volunteers here. And I saw the impact of small gestures in New Orleans. And the thing about New Orleans so soon after Katrina is that, you know, you show up and you've got your paintbrush and you're just, you're ready to jump in. And then you see the scale of what happened here. And it's humbling <laughs> and you, you feel very small. And one day we went to an area near the London Avenue Canal. And this was really ground zero of the flooding. And you might, I don't know if you can see on this photograph, the house has these brown lines, and these are watermarks. And you would see this throughout New Orleans, where the water would fall and settle. And that's where you would get these watermarks. And they were usually around your waist. Well, here by the canal, you know, the watermarks were up here. This house had been completely submerged, and it had multiple watermarks, like, like rings on a tree where the water fell and settled and fell and settled. And this area is completely deserted and we're walking around and it, it reminded me of like Star Trek when the landing party comes down and then all the people are missing. And on this white car, you probably can't see it, but there's the letters DB. And I asked somebody, I said, you know, what does that mean? And he said, it means dead body. So if you're like me and you're an unskilled volunteer, you see this and you feel desperately inadequate. But I had an epiphany one day. We, we did a lot of work at this house. And it was in the Gentilly neighborhood. And one day I was scraping paint in the backyard. Uh, and I finally, I, I told myself this. I said, okay, if I don't scrape this paint, you can't paint the house. And if you can't paint the house, you can't finish the house. And if you can't finish the house, the family can't move back in. The organization rebuilding together can't move on. And this is that same house today. And I was back in New Orleans uh, several years ago, and the gentleman who runs Rebuilding Together drove me around, and I, I would see these amazing before and after scenarios. And we were driving, and he kind of waved his hand out, and he said, you know, we've had about 20,000 volunteers since Katrina, and I guarantee you, every one of these homes has been touched in some way by volunteers. So there is power in small gestures. Lesson number two from global volunteering was this, uh, feeling stupid is good. Um, you know, most of us avoid feeling stupid. No one wants to feel dumb. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel stupid constantly. I, I have felt stupid all over the world. That's sort of my contribution. But I have always found that every time I feel dumb, I learn something about myself, about the work I'm doing, about the local culture. Uh, I felt stupid in Kenya. Uh, you know, we were working at this children's home for two weeks and we stayed with a local woman and her two kids. And one evening we met her for dinner in the city of Mombasa, uh, which is a coastal city in Kenya, uh, about 20 minutes from where she lived. And we're enjoying our, our dinner. We had a barbecued goat and we're drinking our Tusker beer. And I said to her, I said, you know, the Matatus are much nicer here in the city than out where you live. And a Matatu is a shared taxi. It's the main way you get around in Kenya. Most Kenyans don't have cars. You pile into these shared taxis. And here in Mombasa, the, the Matatus were much sleeker and brighter and you know, decorated and they were really nice. And I said to her, you know, the Matutus are much nicer here. And she said, it's Matatus. I said, well, well, what did I say? She said, Matutus. I said, well, what does that mean? And she said, it means 
boobs. <clears throat> so basically, I had been sitting in a restaurant saying, yeah, you, know, you know, the boobs are much nicer here than what I've seen elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty brilliant. Uh, I felt stupid in China. Uh, I don't know if you've been to China. I don't know if you're going to China. But here's a little tip. In China, they speak Chinese. Other than the KFC there in the corner, I have no idea what any of that says. And so for two weeks, my friend and I were wandering around looking for a tea shop, not knowing that we were walking past them constantly. We just had no idea that this was the symbol for tea. So this would be like going to New York City, looking for a Starbucks, walking past 20 of them and saying, you know, I can't believe there's not a Starbucks here. This is, this is outrageous. But one thing I learned, too, is that just as everything is foreign to you, you are foreign to them. Check out the expression of the two guys standing behind me here. The one guy looks sort of slightly amused. The other guy looks sort of mildly disgusted. <laughs> but, but what I found, my friend and I, we were an oddity on the streets. You know, we, we, especially my friend, my friend was blonde. And so people would ask if they could take our picture. You know, it's like we were rock stars or extraterrestrials or something. And it didn't quite make sense to me. Xi'an is... It's a big city. It's 8 million, 10 million people, something like that. It has the terracotta warriors, so there's a big tourist trade there. So why are we not seeing anybody on the streets? Because we would walk every day to this school where we were working, and we would walk around. And then one day I remember seeing a bus go by, and on the bus were all the Brits and the Russians and all these tourists. I thought, oh, well, now I get it. They're on the bus. We're on the streets. And that's one great thing about when you volunteer. It gets you out of that tourist cocoon, and it gets you out among real, local, interesting people. And I also felt dumb in Costa Rica. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we worked at an elementary school. We taught English for two weeks. And the first day we got there, you know, we get in the classroom, and the person who runs the program brought us, and he's talking to the principal and all the kids are staring at us with tiny curious eyes and i remember thinking like wow i can't wait to meet the teacher this is going to be great and the program person uh kind of got up said okay good luck godspeed and he left and i thought oh my goodness we're not teachers assistants we're the teachers which i thought would was kind of like someone who could make toast suddenly running a restaurant uh, and we got through our first day, and at the end, I remember all the kids hugged us, and I thought, well, okay, we may be incompetent, but at least, at least they like us. But, you know, we got better quickly. We talked to another teacher who was there. We developed lesson plans, and we grew enormously fond of the kids there. And I, I dare say they even learned some English while we were there. But here again, there was this intangible quality that was going on. I learned when we were there that most Costa Ricans think Americans are lazy. And I thought, well, well, how can this be? You know, we, we have the American work ethic. But it's because of what they see on TV. This is how most Costa Ricans perceived Americans as the cast from Friends. And what do they do on Friends? Well, they sit around, they drink coffee, they, they don't do a whole lot. But when you're there working with people and sweating with people and laughing with people, it changes how we see each other and we're all just a little less stupid. Lesson number three is this, life is a precious gift. And you're probably thinking, ooh, gee, there's an original idea. But I saw this again and again, and I, I, I saw it in the speed of my father's death. And I saw it in the West Bank. And we were in a little Palestinian refugee camp uh, right near, on the, right on the edge of Bethlehem. And uh, Bethlehem is best known for this. This is the Church of the Nativity. But I got to tell you, just between us, the best thing in Bethlehem, without question, is, of course, the Stars and Box Cafe. <clears throat> best corporate ripoff I've ever seen. <laughs> I, I deeply regret not buying a T-shirt. And so we were there. There were people, there were volunteers from 15 countries. And, and unlike the other projects I did, this one was really just an assortment of activities. We, we helped a farmer build rock walls. We cleaned the streets of Bethlehem before the Christmas travelers 
showed up, which was actually much needed. But one of the big benefits, I think, of these volunteer programs is that you really immerse yourself in an area in a way that you don't when you're just visiting as a tourist. And so we, we stayed in this camp. And I think regardless of where you stand on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, you know, this is a hard life. And it's a very hard place. And we really got a taste of what that's like. You know, we had to go through the checkpoints. You know, they, a lot of men in Bethlehem, they work in Jerusalem. And every day they have to get up at like four in the morning to go through these really horrific uh, checkpoints. And again, it's just, there's, it's just not a happy place. You know, there's just a hardness that's just sort of looming and always there. I'm often asked if I was ever scared when I volunteered, I said the one time I was a little, a little frightened was on this day. Uh, our ho host took us to, it's this protest that happens once a week, every Friday. And I was a little wary of going. I thought, you know, I'm not trying to take sides here, but I thought, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go as an observer. And in a lot of ways, this protest is routine. People show up, they make a speech, they go home. But man, you could just, you could feel the tension in the air. And there are also, you can't see them, but there are soldiers up on a hill. And these, they're kids, they're like probably 18 to 20, and you can tell they're scared. And people are doing their speeches, and it's a mix of locals and international people, and even some Israelis. But, so they're giving their speeches, and I remember this kid, a kid rolled a tire into the razor wire. And then one of the soldiers pushes the kid. And you just feel the whole thing go up a notch, and you can see this one soldier, he's got his finger on the trigger. And we were lucky that day, you know, nothing happened. But two weeks later, the soldiers went around the wire and attacked the crowd. I think the hardest thing I struggled with was in Hebron. And this is not a good picture, but you can probably see that chain link fence that's running up, you know, probably about 20 feet in the air there. And there are settlers who live there and they throw their trash down on the people below. And so the fence is there to catch the trash. I got to tell you, it was, a, it was a very difficult experience. And, you know, you, you go through that and you think, God, you know, like, this is hopeless. You know, I, I, it just feels, it just really kind of crushes the soul. But I, I thought the upside, and I felt this everywhere I volunteered, was that people were talking who would never talk otherwise. And when that happens, it really does change how we see each other. And that, to me, is the great intangible benefit of these volunteer programs this ability to immerse yourself in another area. And that doesn't just happen in urban areas. It, it happened on a deep level for me in Ecuador. And I was with a group called Earthwatch, and they do scientific programs here in the United States and around the world. And here in Ecuador, this is a cloud forest in the Andes Mountains about two hours south of Quito. And they're studying how climate change is affecting the cloud forest. And this is a very remote area. You know, we, we took a bus and the road just ends and you get out of the bus and you start hiking up the Andes. And it's so remote that where we were staying, everything is brought by mule. And I felt really bad for these mules until we started the hike. And then I was like, well, thank God for these mules. And so this is, you know, there's no electricity except for what's on generators. This was my home for two weeks. But this is one of the most ecologically diverse areas in the world. There are more tree species on a patch of ground than you will find in the entire British Isles. And some of them have quite practical purposes. And the wildlife, my God, there's hundreds of bird species. And this was just walking on trails. We encountered an eyelash viper. Uh, these are rare spectacled bears past a tarantula. Uh, this is a worm. <laughs> And I'm told in the rainy season that the worms can grow to be like two and three feet long, which uh, as a fellow volunteer said, that's a big worm. And the thing about a cloud forest is every day about three o'clock, the clouds roll over and they consume the mountains and they consume the trees. And sometimes it would get so thick, you know, we were doing a lot of data collection work to help the scientists it would get so thick, we actually had to stop working because you couldn't see. And the great thing about the clouds is you would get these really spectacular sunsets you know, as the sun kind of tried to fight its way through the clouds. 
But the bad part was, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a space geek. You couldn't see the stars. You know, here we are. We're, we're two hours from the nearest village. There's no light. Can't see the stars. But finally, we had one night. One night where the clouds opened up, and suddenly you can see all these stars we never see here in urban areas. You can see the Milky Way. And it's just, you know, you feel small, but somehow you feel large. Because I remember thinking, you know, as far as we know, this is the only planet that has two foot worms and Earthwatch volunteers and all the things that we take for granted. And in a vast expanding universe, we have all been given that rarest of opportunities, the chance to experience life. And I thought this woman really understand it, understood it. And her name was Anne. And Anne was a 40-year-old college student from the UK. And Anne's story was this. Uh, she was working for a government contractor, but she had this interest in science. And she read Bill Bryson's book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. And on the second page of that book, Bryson states that even a long human life only lasts about 650,000 hours. 650,000 hours. That number struck her. It hit her. And she said she was in a meeting one day, and she looked around the room, and she said to herself in a very English way, why am I giving you lot one of my hours? So she had gone back to school. She got a degree in ecology. And now here she was romping around the rainforest, all because of that number, 650,000 hours. We don't get a lot of time here. And in the words of the great American philosopher, Ferris Bueller, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and take a look around, you might miss something. Lesson number four was this. Hold that thought. Success comes from helping others succeed. And this was something my father told me about a year before he died. And here again, you know, it's interesting about the volunteering experience. You know, you go because you're going to do something. You're going to teach English. But I always thought the biggest benefits were these intangible qualities. And one of them was this, that you, you meet these incredible people who are working in these local communities. And I thought there were two women who I thought really embodied this idea of success. And one was this woman, and her name was Zhang Tao. And Zhang Tao founded the special needs school where I worked in China. And her story was this, you know, she had a son. And at a very early age, she knew he was different. And he was diagnosed with autism. And in China, the traditional belief has been that special needs kids should probably be set aside somewhere. And this is changing rapidly, but it still exists. And so when her son was born and she, he was diagnosed with autism, she thought, okay, I am going to cure him and I'm going to fix him. So she went to see doctors and she lived in Xi'an and she saw doctors in Xi'an. And then she went to Beijing to see doctors. And at one point she actually slept on the streets when she ran out of money so she could still meet with doctors until finally she said, I am so wrong and I am so selfish. And this is who he is, and I, I need to accept that. And so she had founded this school with her fellow desperate mothers, as she called them. And it's in this old tea distributors building, and they don't get any government support, and they struggle to survive. But somehow they do survive through grit and determination and love. And I said to my wife, I emailed my wife when I was there, I said, you know, this, this sounds really cornball but there is a lot of love in this school and it's not easy love. This is the kind of love that tests your, tests your patience and it's the kind of love that tests your limits. And another person that I felt privileged to meet and who I think embodies this idea of success is this woman, Jane Carrigo. And Jane founded the children's home where I worked in Kenya. Now, I am not a religious person. Jane Carrigo is an incredibly religious woman. Uh, Jane, I am convinced, regularly text messages with God. And when God gets a text, he goes, oh, I got to take this. It's Jane Carrigo. And so Jane said that God 
came to her in a dream and God told her to take care of his forgotten children in Kenya. And so she decided to form this home and she had worked at other homes in Kenya. She volunteered herself to get a feel for how they're run and how they work. And when she was ready, the government told her you have to have furniture and you have to have, I forget, something like 20,000 shillings in an account. And she told them, I have nothing. But Jane being Jane, people started contributing, people started giving her furniture, they started giving her money in, and so she bought this house. And when I was there, it was a really pretty cramped setup. It wasn't ideal, but somehow, <laughs> Somehow this woman, she's connected with people in Germany and they've donated money and now they have this big complex, you know, where, they, where the kids live and there's room for them to run around and play soccer and, and they, you know, they're not living on the top of each other. There's, there's multiple places where they, they live and they have these little family units that they've created. They grow their own livestock, excuse me, their own food. They have their own livestock. How does this woman do this? And at this point, she's been running it for 20 years. All, all the girls you see here, they grew up there. They're now parents themselves. They, some have gone to college. Some have gone to trade schools. Some have started businesses. How does this woman do this? And it's partly because she's fiercely intelligent. She's got this deep faith. She pushes and pushes. She's a remarkable woman. And, but at the same time, she told me, she said, you know, I've never been to Europe. I have never been to the United States, but God, God sends me these people. And some people are vessels. And the people who come here are vessels. And you, she said, you are a vessel. And I took that seriously. So whatever money I got from my book went back to the places where I volunteered. And it's not a lot of money. I, I didn't get a big book advance, <coughs> regrettably, but every little bit helps. And the money we've given has helped pay annual school fees for some of the kids. And one of those kids is a little boy named Elijah, and I want to close by telling you about Elijah. You know, every child who's at this home is there for a really sad reason. You know, some lost their parents to HIV and family members couldn't afford to take on another child. Some were abandoned. You know, their mothers were sex workers. Uh, when I was, I was back in Kenya in 2018, and they had just gotten this little girl who had been abandoned on the beach. And two women found her laying in the sand. And, you know, if the high tides had come, she probably would have drowned. But now she was here with Jane. And Elijah had been the product of incest. And because of that, his birth brought shame to the family. And he spent the first year of his life hidden away from view without any nurturing, without any love, one of the mothers told me he, he barely even knew how to eat. She said he would just lay there with his mouth open. But now, she said, now he eats and eats and eats, and he gets his revenge for not having food. And Elijah was about two, and he would come up wanting to be held. And I would think, well, how can you say no to this child? So I would stop whatever I was doing, and I would pick him up, and we would walk. And I had been told in China by the woman who ran the program there. She said, short-term volunteers are like links in a chain. And I had kind of disregarded that as orientation rhetoric, but I came to see the truth in it because I thought, before we came here, someone held Elijah. And when we're here, we'll hold Elijah. And after we leave, somebody else will hold Elijah. And it is far, far, far from a perfect system but it seems better to me than the alternative. And so I do believe in small gestures, and I believe that small gestures taken together can become large gestures. And so I hope we all make the most of our 650,000 hours. I hope we all find success helping others succeed. I hope we all connect with others and learn from others and share our kindness with people at home and around the world. And I wanna thank you for listening to me. Now, I'm going to give you, before we take questions, if there are any, I'll give you a few little thoughts on anyone, for anyone who's thinking about uh, volunteering at home or abroad. Uh, if you're thinking about volunteering here at home, these are some national sites that are worth checking out. <clears throat> Create the Good is an AARP site. 
Uh, I volunteer locally with an organization called Facets, uh, which works with like homeless and near homeless. I, I'm a pantry volunteer. I found that through a Fairfax County site, so I'm sure you can find something locally. But uh, these are just, and I include the Red Cross just because some of these big organizations, Habitat for Humanity, for example, uh, will have plenty of volunteering opportunities. <clears throat> if you're interested in volunteering abroad, these are some sites where you can enter information like, you know, I want to volunteer in in Chile or Argentina, you know, what's available, or I want to, I have this particular type of work I want to do, and it'll filter results for you. Now, I should say, of course, most of these organizations are not active at the moment because of, of COVID, uh, but they're all still, I think, making plans, you know, to move forward as soon as possible. And sites like volunteerforever.com, they have like a real nice primer on, on uh, you know, where you can go, what you can do, how to do it. So, and a lot of these sites will have that sort of basic information as well. Uh, when I volunteered, I started with this. Uh, it's a book called Volunteer Vacations, and it's, it's like a reference book, and it just goes through all the organizations that are out there, what they do, where they go. Uh, I don't know when this book was last updated, but I, I imagine it's still pretty current. A lot of organizations out there, um, these are, most of these I volunteered with, uh, I went to China through Global Volunteers. I uh, went to Costa Rica with Cross Cultural Solutions. <clears throat> I mentioned Earthwatch. Uh, they're a scientific organization that does really cool stuff. Uh, you Belong, I have not volunteered with, but I, I have heard good things about. And one thing I, I should say is that a lot of these volunteer organizations really are, they love having people over 50 uh, because, you know, the image is that college students only do this. That, that was not my experience anywhere. Uh, they like having people over 50 because they're usually more responsible, they're more committed, uh, they're not, they're, they're kind of unflappable, you know, they, they've, they, there's the experience factor. Uh, global volunteers in particular attracts a lot of older volunteers. Uh, in China, we had about, I don't know, 11 to 13 people. No one was under the age of 40. Most were in their 60s, um, and a lot of them taught English to college students. And it wasn't so much teaching English as these college students, they, they knew English, but they didn't really have a chance to speak English. So it, that was, it was enormously valuable, I thought. And Earthwatch, speaking of older volunteers, this is a gentleman named Warren Stort Rowan. And Warren lives in Minnesota. And he always knew that once he retired, he was in the insurance business, that he wanted to see the world. And he wanted to do it in a way where he was really going to get his hands dirty. So since he retired in his 60s, Oren is now in his 80s, Warren has volunteered over 100 times with Earthwatch. And he has done everything from archaeological digs in New Mexico to you know, whale observing in, in Norway, I think. <laughs> he's been everywhere and he's seen a lot. And he even has his own fan club, the Warrenites, of people who have volunteered with him. So if you're thinking about volunteering, just a couple of recommendations. Do your homework. You know, I, I showed you some books and sites. This is not like going to the beach. I mean, you really got to figure out, you know, what kind of work do they do? Is it safe? What is the volunteer? Is the organization, you know, got a good reputation? Uh, ask a ton of questions, you know, is the program run by locals or, or you know, or is it creating employment opportunities? Are you creating partnerships or dependency? You know, the economic thing is, is something to ask about. One, one criticism of short-term volunteering is that it's taking away jobs from local people. So that's, that's something to ask. Now, so in my case, we taught English in Costa Rica, but the principal had, he could not afford an English teacher. This was a luxury. Being able to have a volunteer come and teach English, which he thought was enormously important, was not something he was going to hire someone to do. Ask how your money will be spent. Typically, with a lot of these organizations, you'll pay a program fee, and that covers your lodging, your transportation. You know, usually during the week, you'll go see something. So find out how the money's being spent. And I always asked to speak with a previous volunteer, you know, someone who's been there, they've been in the trenches, what was it like? This is a good book on kind of what volunteering is like. I wrote a blurb for this gentleman. Um, he gets into a lot of the things I just mentioned. 
And I should add too, I, I think a good indication of how good an organization is, is how much research they do on you. So most places where I went, we had to provide references. It was almost like applying for a job. We, I, I, before spending time with kids, you know, we had to submit a, a background check. So I think organizations that don't do that sort of thing, that's a warning sign. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, there are several questions in the Q&A. Uh, okay. That or I can uh, read those as well. I think I, I can see them here. So I'm gonna start at the top. <clears throat> Who picks up the cost of getting you place to place? That's kind of what I just mentioned. Most times when you volunteer through these organizations, you pay what's called a program fee, and that's gonna cover your transportation, getting you from the airport, getting you to the volunteer site. Um, but it, you know, it always, it varies. Um, it's also gonna cover your food and that sort of thing. And this is among the questions you have to ask, because like in some cases, in China, we stayed in a hotel and you know, we ate in the hotel every night for the most part. In others, in Kenya, I stayed with a local woman. Um, and so I, that's one of the questions I think you should ask is, you know, what, what's the food situation? What's the transportation situation? Um, what are you going to, how are they going to take care of you? Uh, there's a next question. What is the name of the school in Kenya? Uh, it was actually a children's home. And it's called the Calvary Zion Children's Home. And they do have a website um, and, you know, I, I, I'm in touch with them pretty frequently. It, it's a, there, there's a Scottish woman who set up a trust to help the, the home. Uh, and it was a situation she had visited Kenya and she, people in Scotland had given her some things to distribute, school supplies and things. And she was just walking around one day and happened to find this home. It was pure serendipity. Uh, and or God's will, according to Jane, but uh, but it's very you know the, the whole uh, what I wrote about for the Washington Post magazine was also about my return to Kenya, but also about this I hate this term orphanage tourism. So uh, in general, I don't really recommend working in an orphanage just because there's so many question marks. But uh, if you want to help out Calvary Zion, I can tell you Jane Carrigo is the real deal, and uh, they do amazing work and like i say a lot of her kids have gone on to college there it's it's i realized when i was there jane doesn't think she's running an orphanage she thinks she has a family with 45 kids another question are there age limits for these volunteer associations yeah as i mentioned they really like older volunteers uh, i encountered people in their 80s who were volunteering um, some of it was just you know working in a school. I think the teaching English thing is a really great way uh, to do that as well. Uh, here's another question. Is there a translator with you when teaching English in other countries? And that was one thing I found frustrating uh, that there, and this probably varies from program to program, but uh, we frequently did not have a translator and it was a real problem like in China. Uh, one of the teachers spoke to like a smidgen of English and it was tough, especially that, you know, and these are special needs kids. I mean, I've, I'm always sort of fascinated that you find a way to communicate anyway, somehow, somehow we manage it. And I, it's funny, usually after I got back from these places, I would be going like, oh, can I have some tea, please? Or, you know, so, but it was frustrating and uh, but I would imagine like if you're teaching with like, college students, it's probably not as much of an issue, but um, that's, I think, among the questions you might ask. There's a question about what can be done to help the people in Beirut. It seems so daunting. How does one even start? Um, you know, when I, I volunteered in the West Bank and I, when I came back, I, I wanted, again, I was going to give away the money from my book. And someone had recommended to me an organization called ANERA, A-E-N-E-R-A, -E which does work in Lebanon and the Palestinian territories. And they support schools. They support things like, you know, helping people to grow food, things like that. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of other uh, organizations, but ANERA is one that I, I know and I trust. 
Uh, what opportunities are there for international programs for seniors with limited finances? Um, one of the sites I showed, uh, volunteerforever.com, uh, they also, I think, help do like crowdfunding opportunities. So that's one way to raise money. Um, you know, and I, I know there are plenty of people who volunteer that have just also kind of done a little fundraiser before they go with their family or their church or their friends and, and people contribute. And then when they go, they kind of share their story with, with people. Uh, another question, what kind of budget should you prepare for volunteering for six months to a year in your experience? Um, you know, some of this, it's not necessarily cheap, even though you're going to try and do something good. Um, it, it's hard for me to say just because it really varies from the country you're going to, the organization. Um, so I, I don't know if I can give you a specific budget, but um, most of the organization I do put the costs on the site. So I would say learn what some of the organizations are and kind of see what the costs are showing. Are any of your expenses tax deductible? When I did a lot of this volunteering, yes, they were. I don't know if that's still the case uh, since the tax laws changed uh, a year or two ago. Uh, someone just asked me, uh, is there another country that you wish to go to in the future that have you, not, you have not been to and why? Um, it's funny. I. I I do some travel writing and, and this is not how it usually works. <laughs> usually I don't do like press trips or anything, but I, about a year ago, uh, an editor who I sort of knew contacted me out of the blue and said, hey, do you want to go on a cruise around uh, the southern tip of South America to see glaciers and fjords? I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? So I had like a day in Buenos Aires and it's, oh, it was just gorgeous. And I, so I'm dying. I want to go back to Buenos Aires. Uh, just, I, did, I just got like a taste of it. But uh, I've always wanted to go to Japan. Uh, my father worked for Toshiba for many years, used to go. He was at the time living in near San Francisco, would go to Japan and just loved Japan. So I sort of feel like I need to go to Tokyo. Question from Larry Lippman. Good to hear from you, Larry. What's the name of the volunteer organization in Fairfax? Uh, it's FACETS, F-A-C-E-T-S, a uh, very good organization. Uh, like I say, they, they, they work with homeless and near homeless. They, they do a hypothermia program in the winter to help protect people. They uh, put families in housing to prevent them from homeless. Uh, homelessness, very good organization. Uh, here's a question. Are you usually paired with a volunteer buddy? Um, yes and no. I mean, frequently... I went with another person, but there were times I went solo. Um, yeah, I think you are in, in many cases. It, it really does vary. I, I, I think like an organization like Global Volunteers, I think if you said, I want my own hotel room, that's fine. But you're sort of paying for that. I went to India uh, two years ago with a group called Medical Missions Foundation. And they send doctors to do like a week of surgeries in areas that have uh, that just don't have the resources. And I did not perform surgery. You'll be happy to know. Uh, I, I went, I knew someone there and they asked me to come do blogging and social media. So it was actually my skill set. But in that case, I shared a room with one of the surgeons just because it was a way for them to reduce costs. So, but you know, I gotta tell you, I've made lifelong friendships. Uh, the people I met in Costa Rica uh, you know, I, I, this was 15 years ago, probably, and we're still, when COVID started, we were doing like Zoom calls together. Uh, what is Jane's last name? It's Jane Carigo, K-A-R-I-G-O. Um, I wrote about her in my book. I wrote about her for the Washington Post magazine. Uh, it was, I think it, the piece was in 2018. This is the one that'll be in Best American Travel Writing. Uh, but if you search online, I would search for... Uh, Calvary Zion uh, Children's Home. Uh, someone asked if I can put the book up again. Let me do that once we finish. Uh, Larry asked, how physically fit must you be? Really depends on the program. Um, if you're teaching, if you're 
you know, that's not going to be much. But it's something like the Earthwatch program in Ecuador, we were, everything was by foot. I mean, we were hiking at least five miles a day. Sometimes uh, there was one day we did like 10 miles. Uh, but here again, there were people in their 60s. I think one guy was in his 70s and it was, it was not an issue, but um, that's among the things I think you have to research. Someone asked, is two weeks the norm for a volunteering activity? Two weeks tends to be the minimum. Um, I have two friends I met volunteering who did it for like six months. Uh, I think most, in some cases you might be able to do it a week, but I think usually the more common is like two weeks, a month, three months, six months. And one thing I didn't mention is something that's becoming a little more common is sort of like family volunteering. So, you know, I know a woman who has brought her kid, her child, and the two of them have gone and volunteered or people have taken their grandkids. Um, and it's, I, 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 when I was in India, one of the surgeons brought his 16 year old daughter and she did a lot of the administrative work and, and things like that. And I, I think some parents feel like, you know, my kid has grown up in this sort of sheltered environment and she needs to see the real world. And it's a real bonding experience too when you go through something like this. Uh, someone asked, thank you. Someone asked my, uh, my newsletter address. Uh, if you go to either my website, kenbud, B-U-D-D dot U-S, you can sign up there or go to 650,000hours.com. And that's 650, three more zeros, hours.com. Uh, here's a question. Do they welcome translator volunteers for the group? Oh my God, I think if, if you have a second language or you can translate, you're gold. <laughs> Yes, they would love to have you. Uh, here's a question. Any insights on the profiles of volunteers from other countries, uh, e.g. Europe, where they might have longer vacations or organized by faith communities? <clears throat> um, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking. If you're asking about faith groups, I know there are plenty of faith groups that do uh, volunteer programs. Um, you know, as far as profiles of volunteers, just from my experience, I met and I, I think this is actually one of the benefits. You know, I talk about you get to meet people from other countries. It's not just the locals. It's people from around the world and even from your own country. In Costa Rica, I remember there was this girl, she was probably 18, lived in some small town in Minnesota and had clearly never left the small town in Minnesota. And just being around all of these volunteers, that was a culture shock. You could tell she had never met anyone. There was a, a woman from New Jersey. That alone just blew her mind. Uh, so the volunteers vary considerably, and that's one of the, one of the strengths. Uh, here's a good question. Did you get sick a lot? <laughs> I have been pretty lucky. Um, I did get sick in, when we left Kenya, and I think what it was, my, my wife is a nurse practitioner, and her advice for developing countries is usually don't eat like peeled fruit, like eating a banana is fine. You can peel it. But if someone has like cut fruit, that's a problem, not because of the fruit, but because we have different germs on our, our hands. So I did get sick at the end of Kenya, but um, yeah, in general, usually the problem I have is you go to places like India, Kenya, I was in Mali about four months ago. Uh, it's the malarone. It's this medicine for malaria that after seven or eight days, it kind of gets to me. But, you know, I think if you eat uh, cooked food, you'll be fine. Uh, I always avoid street food. The street food smells amazing. But <laughs> in India, uh, some street food person was like, oh, I gave us these free food. And, and a woman, a local woman said to me, don't eat that. <laughs> so I thought if she said that. That was a good sign. Uh, here's a question. What percentage of your trips were with your wife and what how many were solo and what are the pluses and minuses? Um, I think it's valuable to go with somebody just because this is a, it's a very intense experience. You know, I, I remember in China, I thought just being in a school and not being able to speak English and not understanding this, all this noise going on, that would be kind of intense enough. But then I didn't have experience with special needs kids. So that was like a whole nother thing. So having someone to commiserate with, I think is useful, but you know, before I went into the West Bank, I was there by myself and I went, I spent a couple of days in Jerusalem and I, I was wandering through, I was doing the stations at the cross 
and I got completely lost. I mean, it's, it's like going through a maze and I latched on to this sort of Japanese tour group, <laughs> just pretended I was part of them. Otherwise I would still be there. Um, and when I was in the West Bank, I, I was solo and it was hard because, you know, it was here again, it's this intense experience, but I, I made, you really connect with people pretty quickly uh, because you're, you're, you know, you're going to have dinner together every night and you're going to talk about what happened. And, and so I, I, in some ways it lends itself to a solo experience for that reason, uh, because, you know, there's usually going to be plenty of people around to talk with. That's a nice feedback. Thank you very much. Um, how and when do you expect opportunities to open up now with the COVID pandemic? Uh, I think it's going to be just like everything else. You know, I, I think they're just following the same restrictions, the same guidelines. Uh, I, I get newsletters from some of these people uh, that, you know, they're still trying to support their partner programs as much as they can. But um, I do think there's going to be sort of a pent up demand. And, and I also have this feeling that once this is over, I mean, so, I think we all just want to go to the beach or something. We just want to go somewhere. But I know a lot of people are sort of kind of evaluating their lives and you know, what, are, what are we doing? So I, I do think once, once things get back to normal, I think these sorts of opportunities, something more fulfilling than just going to Disneyland is something people are going to want. And here's a question from Jim Dow. Very nice to see that name again. Uh, what's next? Um, you know, I was crazy traveling before the pandemic. Um, I, I know people, they, they run a school in Mali and I went with them and Mali, <laughs> Mali is one of these countries uh, where the State Department sends you these messages like, hey, don't go there. It, it's, it gets the same warning levels as like Syria and Iraq. And you, you, know, you get another email like, seriously, don't go there. And then like three days before we're going, I get the State Department email that says, okay, if you're gonna go, make out your last will and testament, uh, leave DNA samples, uh, designate a hostage negotiator. <laughs> So I, I contacted the person who ran this program and, and she, I said, hey, have you been getting these emails? And she goes, ah, they, they send that every year. Uh, so as far as what's next, uh, I, I was in Guatemala as well with some people who run a clinic. You know, like a lot of people I think I'm evaluating, I've put together a proposal for another book called hopefully 650,000 Hours that will kind of look at how we spend our time based on what I've learned from traveling the world. So cross your fingers on that one. We just, we're getting ready to send it some editors and uh, hopefully that'll be next. Uh, here someone says, I'm reading your book and enjoying it. Thank you. I, I did not submit that question myself. Uh, here's someone that says, I recommend family volunteering, brought a 10 year old son on a volunteer trip, trip to Guatemala. That's great. And that's becoming more common, I think. Uh, with the pandemic, are some of these groups using Zoom or some other virtual platform for English classes, for example? Uh, I'm going to guess yes. Uh, I, I know there's a woman uh, who volunteers through Global Volunteers, and she has gone to Poland, I think like 30 times to the same school to teach English. And even pre-COVID, I know that she would communicate with students you know, via Skype or whatever. So you know, what I've found is you don't just go, boom, you're done, it's over. I mean, that happens, but I, in my case at least, in a couple of cases, there have really been enduring lifelong connections that, that happened in Kenya, uh, for example. So yes, I would guess some of these organizations are doing that. So and that appears to be the last question. Um, if you wanna reach out to me, like I say, go to my website, uh, kenbud.us. Uh, or you go to 650,000hours.com and submit something there. Sir, you were going to put up the uh, picture of the book again, I believe. Someone asked for that. Yes. Let me see. Let me share screen again. You're already sharing. Uh, okay. Just go ahead back to your PowerPoint. I'm going to guess it was this book. Uh, hang on a second. The other book is just called Volunteer Vacations, and that's a reference guide. This book kind of gets into more about what the experience is like and offers advice. 
And then my book is really more kind of my experiences as a volunteer, uh, but it does get into some of these issues, but it's, it's more a personal story. Welcome back, folks. I hope you had a chance to refresh your coffee and stretch your legs. Uh, most of you, if you were there last year at our Ali presentation, you will remember our next speaker. Um, uh, and her uh, presentation is titled, Great Gift, Getting Your Legal House in Order. Explaining legal stuff so everyone can understand is Sally Hermes' position, passion and skill, and she really does it well. Her approach seems to be working as the American Bar Association has named her its top selling author. Ms. Hermie has led the national conversation on many of the legal issues of concern to older persons, their families, and their caregivers. Whether the issue is how to make decisions for others to plan for what comes next, she has focused her professional career on explaining the law so everyone can understand it. Recently retired after more than 20 years at ARP, she has focused most recently on providing support and resources for family caregivers. Ms. Hermie is the author of the award-winning ABA slash AARP checklist series. And mostly this, just this spring, she authored Wise Moves Checklist for where to live, what to consider, and whether to stay or go. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Miss Sally Hermy. Sally, it's great to see you. The screen is yours. Hi, Supa, and hi, everyone else. I'm delighted to be with you today. And I'm going to share my screen so that you can see my presentation. We hope, there we go. All right, so yes, it is a great gift to get your legal house in order. And I'm going to explain why it is so important to have necessary financial documents and planning documents, medical documents, all in order, and to have a plan for your family. It will aid you and everyone else. There's lots of things that you can get in order. Maybe some things you already have, other things that you um, don't need, but I'm gonna cover the whole range of things that you might want to be sure that you have some sense of order about. Um, do you have a list of your bank accounts, the pins and what uh, direct deposits are made into those accounts? Do you have a list of all your credit cards? Uh, the credit card numbers, maybe a picture of the front and back of those cards. You can have that um, safely uh, rec recorded. Uh, it's good for you to know in case you might lose your cards so that you know who to contact. And it's also going to be good for your family to know uh, just where you have various credit cards. Do you have a listing of your retirement accounts, where they are located, uh, what, where statements might be filed? Uh, do you know what life insurance policies you have? Do you have them in some sort of organized manner? And while you're pulling together those life insurance policies, now is a good time to check those beneficiary designations. Because with life insurance, the, there will be automatically paid to whomever you have named. And you want to make sure from time to time that you check your designations to make sure that they still reflect what you want right now. And then, oh, uh, do you have a place where you are, have all of your health insurance information, whether it's Medicare or Medicare SUP or any other uh, Part D? You should have at least a folder or a list that 
has the names of each of your uh, health insurance policies, where they might be located, and uh, what the account numbers are and what the contact information is. Other financial things that you need to just have an idea of where they are would be the deeds to your house, maybe the mortgage to your property. Is that all in one sort of centralized file cabinet or drawer or folder or a folder on your computer that has a copy of these various important legal documents. Another thing that maybe you haven't thought about is where to put, um, where to have a record of the important personal property that you have. One good thing to do to make sure of that personal property is to um, uh, go around your house and take pictures of all your various rooms. What's on the walls, what's in the cabinets, open up the doors, open up the uh, closet doors, the cabinet doors, and just go around. With today's iPhone, you can easily take pictures or videos um, and then this helps you in many circumstances. If there should be some sort of natu natural disaster, such as the flood or the horrible wildfires that are going on, um, hurricanes, you never know when you might need a visual record of what you have. What I do is that I've taken those pictures and uh, put them just on a uh, thumb drive and I then put that thumb drive in some safe place such as a safe deposit box or a file proof box. Then if there is any reason why you need to um, make an insurance claim, you will have a visual record of all the things that you have in your house. We've heard terrible stories of people whose homes have been uh, destroyed by fires or by flooding, who to make a claim with their insurance need to be able to document um, what they have, what you have in the garage, what you have in the attic, what you have in the basement, what you have inside, um, your uh, curio cabinets. It's a wonderful thing to do. You just have to do it and it doesn't take very long. Not only is this important for uh, making uh, a, a, an insurance claim, which heaven forbid, we hope nobody ever has to do. This also will be helpful for your family in the event of your death to be able to make know what possessions you have and to make that inventory that may be necessary. Another important thing that really is so important to do to have all put together is to have a list of all of your passwords and user IDs for each of your bank accounts, your online accounts. Somebody needs to know what, how to be able to access um, all of your financial records and your financial documents. But only can, you can do that only if you have an important list. Another important document that you can put together is a calendar, which will show that um, what um, monies you are that are coming in that you can put into that are direct deposited to which bank account? Where does your social security, uh, what, into what bank does your social security check go? And then on that sort of same calendar, you ought to have a record of what auto pays you have and what dates they go out and what those amounts are going to be. Those, um, what is your, do you have your uh, cell phone bill, your utility bill, your mortgage? Uh, what 
auto pays do you have? And by having a calendar, you can make sure that you know the dates that your direct deposits are coming in, as well as the dates that your auto payments are going out, so that you can adjust to make sure that the money's going to be in there ahead of time before the money goes out. One of the things that I think is very important to do is to have some sort of record of where you have various things stored. Um, in my book, uh, Checklist for My Family, I have a where to find it checklist that I think you would find most intriguing, perhaps. It lists all of the various things that you might have and where you have put them. What things are in your safe deposit box? Do you have an inventory of what is in your storage units? Then do you have a list of all your online accounts and those passwords? You, and even do you have a record of what rewards programs you're signed up for? Is that an airline or hotel rewards program? Oh, what rewards programs do you have? What are the balances? What are the passwords to get into those rewards programs? It's important for you to have a good idea as to where things are. And for example, like somebody needs to know where your safe deposit box is, which bank is it with, and where is the key to the safe deposit box? Would somebody be able to get the key if you were not able to tell them where it is? And what's the combination to the storage unit in case someone needs to be able to get into the storage unit when you're not there? Having a record of what's where is very important because you never know when something might come up, whether it's illness or cancer or your own death, that your family needs to know where your stuff is. What stuff do you have? Where is it located? And how is it filed so that they can find it at some point in the future if you're not able to tell them? It's not only important to have your legal life sort of in some sort of great order, but it's also important to do a lot of planning. We do plan. There are lots of fun things that we plan for. <laughs> At least we used to plan for vacations. Now it's a little hard to uh, do that. Some of that vacation planning has been set aside for right now, but we can plan for those vacations that we're going to be able to take next year. We also have fun planning for our retirement planning for how we're going to save our money for retirement, and then the anticipation of what it is that we want to do post-retirement. What are your plans for how you are going to spend your time, where you're going to live, what kinds of activities you want to maintain, how you're going to be able to have more volunteer opportunities within your retirement, and talking about how to make the most of your retirement takes planning from long before the actual date that you're going to retire. And I will have to put in a plug for my book, Get the Most Out of Retirement. I help you walk through in that book lots of the things that you need to do to really have the most fulfilling retirement. It takes some planning. You can't just decide, well, I'm not going to work anymore, so I don't have to make any more plans. 
to have a great retirement, you really do need to make those plans. There are also things that we need to plan for that maybe are not so much fun as planning for a wedding or a vacation or a renovation of our house or whatever we're thinking about. We do need to plan for what we envision for the type of long-term care that we are going to want, what our quality of life is going to be, how we can maintain that. And we also need to plan for what kind of medical care we are going to want in case something comes up. And then another big area of planning that you need to pay attention to is how do you want to distribute your estate on your death? Who's going to get all that stuff that you have now recorded and put into your uh, visual record? Uh, what what, how do you want to plan for what happens to your um, memory, your belongings, your legacy upon your death? Why do you plan? It's the greatest way that we can stay in control of what happens in the future. It gives us the opportunity to evaluate all of our various options as to where we want to live, what quality of life we want to have, what kind of medical care we want. And once you have those plans, it's very important to make your wishes known. If no one knows what you want, they cannot fulfill your hopes and dreams and expectations. And also, we really do know that if you have a plan that helps you avoid having to make crisis decisions when there is some sort of upset or crisis in your, your living circumstances, your financial circumstances, your health circumstances, if you've got a plan and if your wishes are known, then you're going to have more options to take care of yourself and your family and those around you who love you and whom you love. You will have more choices. And if you have a plan and you let those wishes be known to others, it will give you peace of mind that you've gotten things organized, that you've thought through what you really do want. And all of that planning and organization is such a great gift for your family. So let's talk about some of those important healthcare conversations that um, you need to have. You need to know who it is that you want to make what decisions about the quality of life that you want to have to the end of your days. What are your health care preferences. If something should happen, what do you want your family to know about you and about your quality of life and what you do and do not want? You need to have a conversation with the trusted members of your family or your friends or your spiritual advisor, whoever that might be, that has an idea of what is really important to you. What do you want about pain management? What level of pain are you going to want to have managed by those who might be taking care of you and assisting in your treatment? So there are planning documents that are important for you before you die. 
these are documents that you want to have in place now that sets out what your wishes are. There are two legal documents that you need to consider that I like to call the memorialization of the conversation that you've had. The conversation is so important, but you need to put those wishes down in writing. For your health care plans, there, the two documents that you need to have are a health care power of attorney and a living will. While a living will is really a very important document because of the way that it has been statutorily created, it is very limited in scope. And it, but that is a very important scope. It sets out what your wishes are for life prolonging treatments when you have a terminal or persistent vegetative state. If you have a terminal condition or persistent vegetative state, that identifies what you think you do or do not want only under those circumstances. Because living wills are so restricted to terminal conditions and only to life prolonging treatments, while you want those instructions set out, you really need to have a healthcare power of attorney because it is a much broader in scope and you can do so many more things about your health care wishes in a health care power of attorney. Most states, including Virginia, combine these two documents into one advanced directive. But in your health care power of attorney, what you do is you pick the person that you want to be your advocate your spokesperson, the one who talks to the doctors to make sure that your instructions, your wishes are set out. You can, in your healthcare power of attorney, give those instructions about all sorts of other things besides life prolonging treatment, which is reserved for your living will instructions. So you can, again, memorialize the conversation that you've had with your agent in writing. So that provides a backup to your agent so that the agent knows what you, your wishes are and you have that set out in your combined health care power of attorney. Remember that in your healthcare power of attorney, you can give additional instructions like, what do you want for chemotherapy? What do you want for any kind of surgery, antibiotics, use of various kinds of psychotropic medications? You can, those are not life prolonging treatments, but those are instructions that you can set out in your health care power of attorney. It's important to remember that your health care power of attorney is a living document. As your circumstances change, you can have additional conversations with your agent. You can change the instructions or directions in your um, health care power of attorney as circumstances change. But having that conversation and setting it down in writing is so important, not only for you, but for your family and for your health care agent. Why do you need a health care power of attorney? You'll see this slide come up again and again in what I'm talking about. It allows you to stay in control. It allows you to identify what you do or do not want your healthcare 
agent to do. You set out the instructions, the directions, your wishes, your preferences in writing, and you pick that person that you want to have be your spokesperson, your advocate. Without a health care power of attorney, you lose that control. Don't worry, though. The state of Virginia or wherever state you're living, there is a statute in the books that picks the decision maker if you have not picked a decision maker for you. We, um, in Virginia, the statute sets out what they, what the legislators thought you would want to have make your decisions for you. They had to do a best guess. They kind of had to presume who an ordinary person would want to have. And it might be that, yes, you want your spouse to be your decision maker. But if you do want your spouse, why not override what the legislature said and pick the person that you want? Or it may be in some emergency circumstances where you do not have a health care power of attorney that it will be necessary for your family to apply to the court to pick a decision maker to make health care decisions for you when you can't. And the court would then pick from likely alternatives the decision maker and direct the decision maker as to what powers and what kinds of decisions they can make. Remember, you can always uh, change your health care power of attorney. You can always change your instructions. You can always change your decision maker. But you can stay in control if you have this document available. There is another kind of medical order that is different from a health care power of attorney. Those medical orders are signed by your physician and entered into a part of your medical record. This might be a do not resuscitate order, which directs the hospital team not to attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation or other life-saving, life-sustaining measures. Obviously, the physician does not enter a do not resuscitate order without conferring with you as the patient or conferring with your health care power of attorney. But the medical orders are the implementation of the order that the physician has put into your record. Now, note that I said that this medical record directs the hospital team to, if you wish, not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. But there's a problem with um, some most medical orders, <laughs> or there's a limitation. Let's not, not call it a problem. Let's call it a limitation because it's a medical record that directs the hospital team as to what medical orders they're going to have. There, Virginia knows by legislation that there are circumstances when someone would want to have a out of hospital do not resuscitate order. Someone may be in a critical condition and not want to have a, a DNR, but they may be not in the hospital. So an out of hospital do not resuscitate order, or in Virginia is called a durable DNR, is a special kind of medical order. 
because out of the hospital, such as if you are at home or are um, uh, in assisted living or in a nursing home, and if there is a medical emergency and 911 is called, emergency responders must morally and legally attempt resuscitation, attempt all efforts to restore your heartbeat or your breathing. With an out of hospital DNR, the emer emergency physicians, I mean the, uh, yeah, the emergency responders have the, can look at a special bracelet that you might have that is, uh, tells the em emergency uh, first responders not to attempt resuscitation. The out-of-hospital DNR is really a document that someone with a critical condition who knows that they may have a uh, their heart stops or their breathing stops and they do not want, wish to be responded, it helps them stay in control of their medical wishes. There is another kind of medical order, which is in Virginia called a post. It is a physician's orders for scope of treatment. This is a very special kind of medical order. It is really only necessary or used for very chronically ill patients who may have multiple types of uh, conditions uh, from um, diabetes to uh, a heart condition, all sort of mushed together. And what happens with the creation of a post is that the physician speaks with the patient who have what we call comorbidities and finds out what their current treatment preferences are. What do you want done if X happens tomorrow or next week or next month? The reason why a post is so um, important in these very special circumstances is that if the person, let's say, is, is it in and out of the hospital, going to the nursing home, going to assisted living, going home, but going back to the hospital, the post is designed to coordinate care among multiple specialties, such as heart or oncology or uh, diabetes or whatever, so that there is coordinated care that will be recognized across care settings. So you don't have to go through th this discussion every time you go home or you go to the hospital. Um, it can be used across care settings and recognized by the nursing home staff, by emergency physicians, uh, by um, first responders. And it's important in these special circumstances for chronically critically ill persons who may be treated at multiple locations. It typically is in um, fluorescent orange or fluorescent green, so it's very obvious and it's on top of the medical records and travels with the patient between various care settings. It augments the health care power of attorney and or living will. It supplements it so that there are clearer instructions when someone is chronically ill. 
there are there's another legal document that helps with your planning and I think is very important for you to consider writing what do you want at the end of your life have you put down in writing what kind of funeral or barrow you want what are your thoughts about where you want to be buried do you have a funeral do you have a burial plot where is the deed are you going to be buried with your spouse at cemetery x or do you want to be cremated does somebody know what your preferences are what kind of funeral do you want there are lots of options do you want a celebration of life a graveside ceremony do you want where do you want your ashes scattered if you wish to be cremated or are they going to be buried in a columbarium or in a burial plot what are your thoughts about the kind of funeral that you you wish do you have uh, preferences for scripture for prayers for speakers that you want to give your eulogy or do you want family members to give various remembrances where do you want the ceremony do you want it in a church or a synagogue or at the grave site we all know that today sometimes it's very it's being much more difficult to have the funeral that we all sort of wish because of the coronavirus but as we get on the other side of this i think the importance of that family ceremony has been brought to fore and you need to uh, talk about write it down what your thoughts are you know you could even write your own obituary there's no harm in doing that I call this writing about what you have in mind what your wishes are a letter of instruction number one it can be easily changed it doesn't have to be official it can be handwritten just sign it and date it and let a trusted family member know where they are what that conversation might be they you stay in control you make sure important people know what your wishes are they cannot carry out your wishes if they don't know what those wishes are there are other important financial conversations that you should be having you need to have a plan so that you can stay in control if you be in come incapacitated in any way shape or form who do you want to make what decisions about your financial affairs that's for while you are still alive who is going to make what decisions about your financial affairs while you are alive then there are other important financial conversations about who do you want to make what decisions about your final arrangements your final estate plan who do you want to make what decisions about the distribution of your estate again there are important documents that you need to prepare that are all about you before you die and this is what we call the power of attorney there are lots of different kinds of powers of attorney um, there's like the common power of attorney 
is the power of attorney that you might sign. Um, let's say you're going to sell your house and you're moving to the new location and you can't be present for the real estate settlement. You might sign a common power of attorney selecting an agent to do one thing and that is to sign the documents at the real estate um, settlement uh, because you can't physically be there. It only does one thing. It picks an agent to do one thing. That's to close out your house. Or you might uh, use a power of attorney uh, if you want someone to manage your uh, affairs while you're going on an extended trip. Um, somebody that has the authority to collect your mail, to uh, water the plants, take care of the pets, whatever it might be. Um, you pick somebody to do something that has a specific beginning, the date I leave for my vacation, and it has a specific ending. When I come back from vacation, that agent no longer has any authority to do any of the things that you asked them to do, you authorized them to do, you delegated to them to do just for a specific time period. One of the legal problems about a common power of attorney is that with the power of the legal concept is that you are supervising your agent doing the things that you have told them to do that you can't do for yourself. And the legal concept is that if you're not able to supervise that person, then that agent shouldn't be going around doing things in your name. By statute, we recognize that there are definitely circumstances in which I want my agent to do things when I can't supervise them. And this is what we call a durable power of attorney. A durable power of attorney, because you have said so in writing, in the document that you want your agent to continue to have the authority to continue working on your behalf after you become incapacitated or unable to watch out for what they are doing. The durable power of attorney by its specific language says that I want my agent to continue to have the ability to act on my behalf even after I become incapacitated. So a durable power of attorney changes the common power of attorney, which would end with your incapacity by statutorily allowing you to say, I want my power of attorney to continue to act after my incapacity. Now remember I said with a common power of attorney, it starts when you sign it and ends when you become incapacitated. You can also create what we call a springing power of attorney. In that document, you identify when it starts you sign it now, but you say, agent, I want to do the paperwork, but I don't want you to do anything on my behalf until some time in the future. It could be a date, like I'm signing the power of attorney today, but I'm not going on vacation until December. And you don't have any authority between now when I sign it and December when I leave. So a springing power of attorney, you can say something at some time in the future. Now, one of the problems with the springing power of attorney that we recognize is, sure, we know 
like if you say December 1st, 2020, you know, everybody knows when December 1st has happened. But if you say, I want it to start at some point in the future um, that is not date specific, you have to be able to identify that event well enough, describe it clear enough so that someone, anyone would be able to know that that event has happened. And you can have a springing power of attorney that starts in the future, as well as a durable power of attorney that says, I don't want it to end upon my capacity. I want it to stay longer than that. Any kind of power of attorney dies upon your death. The agent has no authority to act after you die. So why do you want a financial power of attorney? You stay in control. You pick what you want your agent to do. You give the agent instructions about what you do or do not want them to do. Uh, you tell them you can do this, but you can't do that. You can sell my house or you can't sell my house. You can sign these contracts. You can't sign those contracts. And you pick the person that you want to be your agent to do the things that you have told them to do. Without a financial power, you do not, you lose control. You cannot pick the person. You don't pick the powers. You don't, they don't have any instructions. So what happens if you need a financial decision maker and you have not done a financial power of attorney? Your family will need to go into court to pick the decision maker who will make those financial decisions while you are still alive and will give that person what the court thinks are the powers and authority that that person needs to be. This is going to be a guardian or a conservator, something that you easily can avoid if you have made a plan and put it in writing. Pick the powers, give the instructions, and pick the person. There are other legal documents that you want to be sure that you have, and that is for not so much for you, but it's for your family after you have died. One of the most obvious documents is a, a will, a last will and testament. What you do in your will is basically identify the, how you want your assets, your property, your personal possessions, your money, your resources, whatever they might be, how do you want those distributed after your death? And in your will, you can pick special beneficiaries that you want that you can identify uh, who outside of your family or charities or who do you not want to inherit. Uh, whatever those special circumstances are, you can identify what you're going to put, uh, who is going to receive part of your legacy. You can put conditions on uh, how your property is going to be distributed, and you pick the person, again, that you want to be your executor. The executor is the person who is responsible to you and to the court for carrying out the directions, the instructions that you have put into your will. Again, why do you want a will? You stay in control. We're control freaks. We want our property distributed according to our wishes. And with a will, you pick the person who is going to be in charge of carrying out your final wishes. You pick the powers. You tell them what they can and cannot do, what the, what, what how they are to handle your uh, property, 
and you give instructions. I want you, executor, to distribute this property to this person. Pay these debts, forgive these debts, make these gifts. These are the instructions, and I tell you what to do. You don't have to have a will, but we really want to stay in control. Without a will, you lose that control of picking who you want what and who you want to make sure carries out your wishes. Don't worry, your property will be distributed according to state statute. There's the Virginia Code has lots of directions as to how your property is going to be distributed if you do not have a will. The court will pick the administrator who will take care of carrying out the statutory requirements for the distribution of your property. The state statute will also give instructions to your court-appointed administrator who will distribute your property to the heirs according to the state statute. The statute of descent and distribution in Virginia identifies what the ordinary common person would want, who they the legislature figures out most people would want. And it's probably pretty close to what you want, but it has a priority list of how your property is going to be uh, distributed. It's going to go to your spouse, and if no spouse, then to your children, and if no children, then to grandchildren, and then, or to, if there are no children, then to siblings, and then if there are no siblings, to cousins and uncles. And there's a whole statutory scheme that finds the next person most closely related to you who will get your property. And the statute has all sorts of permutations and combinations of, let's say, what happens if um, um, there are adopted children, children by second marriage, um, if there's um, a child who would inherit, who has predeceased you, but they're surviving uh, grandchildren, how does all that property get distributed? And like if there are three, two people in the same category, is it distributed 50% or if someone is, or if one has died, does that share go to someone else? There's a very specific scheme as to who is going to get your property. If if you don't have, if you have a will, you can distribute to anyone you want. Without a will, you cannot make a special bequest to um, the next door neighbor or the caregiver or the college friend or your best friend who is not related to you, that you want to have some uh, portion of your estate. You cannot make bequests to uh, charities, to your church or your synagogue or to the university that you graduated to from or the, your favorite charity, whatever that might be. Um, the state statute of distribution does not allow for any of those special things that you might find very important. And that's one reason why you want to have a will. And it's important to remember that you need to be checking up on your will from time to time. Um, 
you need to uh, have a way, you need to think of your will as a living document. And there is a simple way to amend your will. It's called a codicil. And you need to sign your codicil with the same formalities with the notary and the witnesses all gathered together in sort of a signing ceremony, just the way you signed your will. But you can add bequests, you can change the percentage of the estate. Let's say you want 25, you said you wanted 50% to go to X, but you change your mind and you want it to go 25%. Or you can um, change the amount. You could want you know, $10,000 to go to this charity and $5,000 to go to that charity. You can do that in your will. And if you change your mind, you can change it through a codicil. I want to talk about another kind of um, letter of instruction. And that is, who do you want to get what of your personal items? This letter of instruction is different than letter of instruction one. This is a supplement to your will. It's attached to, but it's not a part of your will. It can be easily changed, but you can say, I want the necklace that I got from my grandfather to go to my granddaughter, or I want uh, the painting on the wall to go to Fred. Um, if you stay in control with a letter of instruction of number two of who gets what, you can make a great gift to your family. You will be getting, um, providing peace in the family so that there's not those endless discussions over who is going to get what, which picture that you have on the wall. It's not a legal document. I mean, it is a legal document, but it's not part of your will. Um, all you need to do is sign and date it. You can easily change it. Another thing for your family after you die is a trust. A trust document is has three parties to it. You are the grantor. You name the trustee and the successor trustee that you want to be in charge of managing the trust, as well as you name the beneficiaries and the secondary beneficiaries who are going to um, take the benefit from the trust. It's important that you put whatever you want into the trust it has to the property has to be legally conveyed out of your name into the trust you can give instructions in your trust as to how you want your successor trustee to manage your property during any incapacity and you also put instructions into the trust as to how you want uh, the items in the trust to be distributed to the secondary beneficiaries after your death. Why a trust? Again, you stay in control, you pick the person, you pick the powers, and you give instructions. Without a trust, any assets that you have will go through probate and will go through, will be distributed according to the terms of your will. Or if you don't have a will and you don't have a trust, your property will be distributed according to state statute. So now it is your turn. I am going to see um, what I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at the questions um, okay, I'm looking at the questions that have come in. One from Linda. If your spouse doesn't have a health care power of attorney and there's no will and there's no trust, 
do you automatically have the right to make health care decisions? Maybe. <laughs> Most health care providers will look to immediate family members if there is a need for a medical decision. There is a state statute which covers that circumstance. And under the state statute, if there is no will, no, I mean, excuse me, if there is no health care power of attorney or guardian and no one there to make uh, decisions on behalf of the person who cannot make the decisions, then according to the statute, the spouse is going to be the first person that the health care providers are statutorily authorized to um, um, make decisions on behalf of the person. Of course, the better thing to do would be really to convince your spouse to uh, sign a power of attorney. They're free, they're available, they're available on the AARP website, they're available from hospitals, from doctor's offices. Uh, it's a simple matter to do. I know that there is reluctance on the part of lots of people to sign a healthcare power of attorney, but it is such a gift to the rest of the family so they know the instructions and they know who you want to be in control. Um, uh, no, a letter of instruction does not need to be notarized. Uh, it doesn't need to be witnessed. Just sign it and date it, whether it's the letter of instruction about your uh, funeral and burial plans or whether it's the letter of instruction about the distri distribution of your personal property. Just sign and date it. No need to notarize it. Um, okay. Uh, can I put up who? Oh. I will put back up the slide with the other checklists that are available. I will do that. Uh, but Leah, who initiates the post? I think it's going to be a team decision to initiate a post. Uh, your agent can do it. You can do it. Your physician uh, can do it. Uh, it's really a, the, what I like about a post is that it's a team decision with the patient and the agent and the physician that we need to have a more specific plan for immediate care that augments what can be pretty general in a healthcare power of attorney. Um, so the patient probably and the physician and the agent are going to work together to implement the post. Um, so, uh, let me, uh, uh, I have a recommendation. Can I refer a good law firm? I cannot do that. Um, but I can recommend one place to go to find what I consider to be um, well-experienced elder law attorneys. I'm a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. And... Um, I would go there on their website. You can find an attorney. Uh, you can put in a zip code or a town, and it will list um, um, uh, lawyers who are experienced elder law attorneys. Um, and that's the best resource that I could point you to. Uh, there was a request to go back up to the last screen. And I will share that. These are, um, can you see that? Uh, I hope so. Um, let me minimize this so that I can see. But um, the books that I've written are Checklists for My Family, Checklists for Family Caregivers, uh, Checklists for Family Survivors, Get the Most Out of Retirement, and wise moves. These are all part of the ABA AARP checklist series, and they're available on the on Amazon, on the AARP.org uh, website, and in Barnes and Noble uh, uh, bookstores. And 
Let me stop that and see if there are more questions. Can I repeat my last sentence about probate? Um, my la I'm not quite sure what my last sentence was about probate, but probate is the process by which your estate will be distributed. That's your uh, primarily your, your assets, your pro real property, um, will be distributed either under the terms of your will or according to the state statute. So I do believe, how do IRAs work with no beneficiary? Um, well, the IRA contract that you have um, um, how, will identify what happens to the IRA upon your death if there's no designated beneficiary. Under most circumstances, but it's going to depend on the terms of the contract of your IRA, that it will just go to your estate and will be distributed then as part of your um, your assets within your will that you have distributed or part of your estate that will be distributed uh, according to state statute. Um, is the letter of instruction uh, items, yes, the items that you put in your letter of instruction, those personal property, they, um, you know, your, your jewelry, your um, paintings, your furniture, your collections, your memorabilia, your car, whatever those things that you might want to distribute, they're part of your estate. You're just directing, and they would be part of the value of your estate, but that, those are really more the items that have personal va value, sentimental value, um, that you want to be sure goes to someone else. Yeah, they're part of your estate. You're just helping your family know how to distribute personal items. Um, Iris says, is there a specific form to fill out regarding um, a condo? Well, you have a deed with you when you purchased your condo. And that deed is going to be in your name. And that is considered real estate just like a regular house. And you can identify who you want to inherit your condo. You can have your condo uh, jointly owned with a spouse. And if it's joint with right of survivorship, you die, the condo would automatically become part, would belong to the co-owner, your spouse, or, or whoever else is on the deed. Um, otherwise, your condo is just part of your estate and would be distributed, uh, again, according to the terms of your will, if it is not if it's solely in your name and is not um, uh, jointly held by someone else. Um, uh, Amber, I see people's hands raised, but I'm not quite sure um, what the question is. Uh, one question is, um, the website for elder law attorneys is nala.com, N-A-E-L-A.com, National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, W-W-W-N-A-E-L-A. -E I, I uh, am getting... Okay, Suba. Hi, hi, Suba. Well, thank you, Sally. That was amazing information. Um, and again, this is Suba on behalf of ARP Virginia. Um, Mike, can you see me? Uh, yes, sir, I can. All right. 
Um, again, I'd like to thank our fantastic guest speakers today, uh, Sally Hermy and Ken Budd, for sharing their valuable time and knowledge with us this morning. I also want to thank Mike and Susan at Ollie, who really helped us set this Zoom up. And also to Ms. Amber Sultani, our Associate State Director here in Northern Virginia, who really did amazing behind the work to uh, get this uh, academy set up this year. Um, anyway, I want to just go over a few closing notes. Uh, AARP is the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how to live as they age. We hope you'll join us for future events. And of course, please stay connected. You can find us online at aarp.org forward slash VA. And again, that was aarp.org forward slash VA. Of course, like us on Facebook at AARP Virginia, and that was AARP Virginia. So uh, we're only halfway done. We'll see you again in two weeks on Saturday, September 26th for day two of the Boomers Academy, where our guest speakers will be Martha Bretton Schneider, author of Blooming into Mindfulness, How the Universe Used a Garden, Cancer and Carpools to Teach Me that Calm is the New Happy. And Mr. Steve Muddy, Executive Director of Volunteer Fairfax. So until then, take care of yourself and those you love. So thanks guys and thanks for zooming in today. Bye-bye.